OK, so the question is, is uh, are you guys ready for boring technical detail? Or <laughs> yes. Because I've got like two forms of talks. Like one, one is like introducing Node and like giving examples and like it's actually getting quite fun to give this that talk now. And then I've got like this other talk, which is my roadmap talk, where I kind of talk about like oh what we're doing next and this thing is bad and that thing is not so good and yada yada yada. Okay, so. I forgot which one was the first one and which was the second one. OK, so raise your hand if you want roadmap. Yay. OK, I think, that's, I think that's sold it. How many of you here want to see a Hello World HTTP de uh, demo? None. OK, excellent. We have decided. So it will be extremely boring. I'm sorry. Um, and full of technical detail. Um, However, there will be one coding example, which hopefully will be fine. So anyway, Node is this project, right? It's, it's the server-side JavaScript project. Um, and I think one of the major problems with this is uh, with Node in general. All right, so, so we're coming along, right? I, I kind of had this talk last year, actually, I think a year ago, probably today or something, uh, where I announced this at JSConf and it got a lot of publicity and a lot of people came to the project and there's been a lot of work going on and we're building out this whole new platform, which is kind of a crazy thing. Um, and now it's a year later and we've got some resources to work on it and stuff. And so, so where are we going? One of the major problems with Node at the moment is API stability uh, in that every new version, something changes. And there's really good reasons for, for, for the API to change very often because it, it sucked before and it needs to move forward. But obviously, if we're building a platform that we intend people to actually use, that becomes less acceptable over time. And so the project is still moving very fast and we're, we're trying out a lot of new ideas and innovating, um, in my opinion. Um, so there will be still API changes. However, we've kind of forked off a branch, the, the 02 branch, which is completely API stable, both at the JavaScript level and C++ level and binary level, which means if you have an uh, add-on module that is compiled, say you have a binding to libxml, and you upgrade Node, you can be sure that the, the same compiled binary uh, uh, DLL can be loaded into the uh, new version of Node. Um, so, 02, I told you this is going to be an extremely boring talk. Um, so, right, this is ongoing, and you can expect <coughs> API stability from 02 uh, probably for the next couple months, and then you're completely screwed. Um, at which point, we will move to a 0.4 release, which will be the next stable release. So there, there's, we're kind of forking off branch because we, we have to keep moving very rapidly in, in different API breaking ways. Um, and that's the 0.3 branch. Yes. So anyway, uh, what I would like to tell you is a little bit about what is different in 0.3. So in particular, uh, there's this thing called fast buffers. Uh, long stack traces is something that I would like to land, but has not landed. Fast buffers has landed. And um, the streams interface is getting fleshed out, and I'll explain what I mean by streams interface and what streams are and why you might want them. So, yes. Um, so, fast buffers. So, the problem is, is that JavaScript has no binary anything, right? All it has is strings. Oh, well, I guess you can have like arrays of integers. Um, but I mean, basically, there's, there's very few ways of dealing with binary in JavaScript. By the way, please just interrupt me at any moment, because it just looks like a field of blank faces there, and which I agree. I mean, this is extremely boring. Um, so, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so the problem is is that we had to add this this kind of binary type for lack of. It, it, we deal a lot with with binary TCP protocols. We we deal with file on the disk. We we have to be able to speak binary. Like that might be using only uh, Unicode strings in in the browser might be acceptable. 
But once you start trying to write web servers and trying to do real sort of things, it becomes very apparent very quickly that strings are just not up to that job. So we added something to do binary with, and we call it buffers. So buffer is just this allocation of memory outside of V8. It's very simple. You can uh, you have the square bracket operator. You can assign new values to those things. Um, and yeah, so, so we, we did that. And that was actually a really nice uh, improvement to Node when, when that landed, because now you could actually do binary. Actually, a, bit, a big improvement. But what we noticed over time was that these buffers were very difficult to allocate. It took, they were very slow. And somehow they were straining the garbage collector a lot. Now, this is a totally V8-specific issue. Somehow, the, the add-on interface, the, the, the C++ API that, that V8 provides, through which we created these, these uh, buffers, um, turns out that's kind of slow. It's, it's not as fast as just writing things in pure JavaScript, which is kind of not what you would expect, right? Um, I come from the Ruby world, and in Ruby, you just do all that you can to like put everything into C, because every time you write a line of Ruby, it gets slower. Um, here, it is the opposite. Actually, every time you write a line of C++, it gets slower, because V8 has some crazy machinery going on right? that, that, that can uh, execute JavaScript extremely fast. Um, so we're sitting there, and we're like, oh, OK, wow, these things are really slow. And so this fast buffers is a way of improving uh, buffers. And what it is is basically using the old buffers as a memory pool behind the scenes and kind of using little pure JavaScript objects, which are just kind of offset and lengths uh, mapped to these real buffers under the table. The old buffers are now called slow buffers. The new buffers are called, the fast buffers are called just buffers. And it was a big improvement. Um, so where you had to fear about allocating for doing like new buffer before, now you can safely do that without risk. Um, yes, this is what I said. So fast buffers are pure JavaScript buffers referencing a underlying larger C++ buffer. Everybody wanted to know that, I know. So um, <laughs> long stack traces. So there's this other problem in Node, which is not really a Node problem, but more generally uh, in a vent loop problem or a single stack world problem, which is that your stack is your your call stack is constantly getting blown out, right? So, if you've ever you 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 have this problem in the browser a lot, where you get an exception and you just end up in a random function, um, you you don't know how you arrived at that function because it 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 resulted in from some event, but you don't know how that event was was uh, was made. Um, so so here's here's a. Here's an example. So you do t two set timeouts, and and they're they're kind of set for random values, right? You you don't you don't really know when when uh, which one will execute first, right? It could either be line five, or it could be line six, right? Um, and what what happens is you know after a small amount of time, you're going to get this this error thrown, and I mean obviously in this case you don't really care which one it came from because it's a simple program, but you could imagine a much larger program where you get an error thrown and you want to figure out where this error occurred from, and uh, you just get this small stack trace because you've been constantly blowing out your stack all the time. You're always returning to the event loop. Um, so this is an attempt to solve that problem. Uh, we'll see how it goes. It, it, like I said, it, it hasn't been landed yet. Um, so what this does is it uh, <clears throat> it kind of it, it unifies all of the event emitters in, in Node um, and allows you to kind of dynamically enable this thing where every time an event is, every time you set up a new event, it records where that event came from. So in this case, um, oops, in this case, uh, when you set up the two set timeout events, it records that it came from the loading the main module event, 
right? So you kind of have this chain of events. And then you could imagine more set timeouts in that f function call, which would reference the original set timeouts. Um, so this is called event source. Um, and what happens is you can, theoretically, when this is landed, uh, dynamically enable these, these things to record the stack every time you set up a new event that will eventually call some, some callback, you kind of record where you are in the stack. And um, then you can get this there. See that it was called from line 5, which the, the set timeout on line 5. And so, so this is possibly going to give you a way to kind of walk back through time to uh, arrive at some time when, you're, uh, when you, you know what's going on in your program. Um, so this is kind of uh, a more general refactor. Largely, it, it, it kind of unifies how we call into JavaScript from the event loop. And um, <clears throat> it, it does it by having kind of a general thing called a, a event source, which is the C++ thing. Every time you call into JavaScript from the event loop, you go through a, an event source. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the nice things is that this won't change the, the API at all. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's kind of a massive change. So it, it won't land in, in 0 0.2. Um, <clears throat> so. I think the really nice thing about this part of this whole refactor, because you kind of have to know every time you're calling off the event loop to kind of record the parent who 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 sent you there. Um, I, it, it gives you kind of a nice hook for for doing various things. For example, uh, putting in hooks for for dtrace probes, so that you could get a dtrace uh, probe every time you uh, every time you hit an event and be able to kind of see those things. Um, and, and just generally, we'll, we'll clean up the code because we have various ways of calling into JavaScript at the moment, and this unifies it. Boring, I know. Totally boring. No, this is, this is cool. This is all you have to know, which is like, oh yeah, there's going to be a dotted line, and then there'll be like more stack, and I'll be able to debug my program, <laughs> which may be cool. It might not ever happen because it's unclear if this actually works, but it, it seems to work. <laughs> So more interesting and, and more understandable and less you know, internals is uh, the idea of streams. So Node, I think that a lot of people's programs these days are generally proxies, right? You're, you're talking to a database, you get some data, you like send it to the client, and you, know, you, do, you do some munging in between. But generally, we're writing proxies, kind of taking data from the disk and sending it over there. And, doing this sort of thing, and very often these are streams, right? Not datagram messages, but a TCP stream, a stream from a disk, uh, these sort of things. Um, and so what we want is to have kind of a unified notion of streams in Node and have it be pervasive throughout the system. Um, so... <clears throat> Here's a simple proxy where you take data from socket A and you write it to socket B. So, and this, this works, right? You, you have two sockets. You just kind of listen for the data event on, on one of them, and, and you write that data to the other one. And you know, if there's not so many connections and uh, you know, you're not dealing with too much data, this is, this is a fine proxy. It, it does fine. Um, but you know, if, if socket A is, is receiving a lot more data than socket, say socket B is connected to, uh, you know, a cell phone or something that has a, a very small throughput, then the, the data starts backing up, right? All this data is coming in on socket A and it's just kind of backing up at socket B and it's like, okay, what, what do you do, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're exp node is buffering this stuff in memory. So, so node has this idea where when you do socket dot write, it like, it it takes care of it for you, right? It, it's not ever going to say, uh, if you're familiar with um, POSIX, it's never going to say e again, right? It's it's going to say, okay, we buffered it for you. If it, if it can't send it to the kernel, it'll buffer it in user space. But this is bad for systems like 
this proxy where you're just going to start buffering up me stuff in memory. And um, so how do you deal with this? Um, and streams is kind of the answer. Um, by having, I mean, there's a, there's a proper way to deal with this, which is you turn off socket A, <laughs> right? You say, okay, socket A, stop giving me data. And in turn, by, by, stop pulling, by stopping uh, the, the loop that's pulling off data from the, from the, from the kernel, uh, the, the TCP stack is, is going to get backed up, and then it's going to start not acknowledging received packets, right? And, and TCP has kind of a built-in throttling mechanism. And the, the, the sender on the other end will be notified that, yes, I should possibly stop sending this large file to you at this moment and resume in a few seconds when you are able to accept new stuff. Um, so, um, oh, see I'm, I'm getting disjoint from my slides here. Um, <clears throat> so, this is all that I just said. So, um, right. <laughs> so, so, here's how you deal with it. Um, what you do is you listen to the return value of write. And usually write will return true, which means, yes, we are fine, keep sending data, we can flush this to the kernel, we're going fine. But eventually, send if, if, if socket B gets blocked up, um, then socket B will write, um, will, will return false, which means, please stop sending me data, we are buffering now in user space, and in a not so distant future, the entire system will be destroyed. Now, it's 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 of course a suggestion that that you that you act on this because we want kind of this this nice uh, write where you don't possibly get e again at every stage. It, write will always work, um, but unless you act on this in in high uh, throughput servers and high concurrency servers. Uh, you're going to get blown up memory. Um, so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to pause socket A, which simply stops it from reading new data from the kernel. Um, and then when, when socket B emits drain, which means you know it's, it's kind of queued up all this stuff to get sent out to socket, to so I'm getting my sockets confused, to socket B, um, you know, once that gets drained, then it goes, okay, drain, send me more data. And so you can resume the, the sending from, from socket A. So this is kind of complicated, right? I mean, it, it, it's not totally complicated, but we don't really want the user to have to write the same amount of code every time they want to pipe data from one place to another. We kind of want this to be built into the system. Um, <clears throat> right, so skipping that, sorry. Um, so, so, right, N Node does this... Um, I feel like this slide is out of order. I'm sorry. What I really want to skip to is a demo. Sorry. Apologize for my bad slides here. So what we really want to do is, is jump to this thing called pipe, which is um, doing that throttling for you. Um, it's, uh, it, it does that, it, all that code that I had there where you wait for, for write to return false and then you pause it and then you resume on the other end. This is what the pipe thing does. So you take socket A and you pipe into socket B. Um, and so this is supposed to resemble like Unix command line piping where you grep a file and pipe to wc-l or whatever. Um, except, it, I mean, in, in Unix, you're, you're dealing with each of these things as a process, right? And you're, you're kind of piping the standard out from one into the standard in of another, and you're, you're kind of dealing with these large objects, right? I mean, processes are kind of, they're heavy things. Node's just one process. Here we're dealing, these are lightweight pipes, right? I mean, the, this is all within one process, and these streams are very, they're not threads, right? They're, they're very lightweight. It's just a couple of kilobytes of, of memory associated with this. And so now we're, we're doing Unix piping, but very lightly. 
Okay. Um, so uh, what I want to do is is an example of this. Um, so so what we'll do is is we'll write a little server, um, which uh, it's going to be it's going to be a little process, and it has a TCP server and an HTTP server. And what happens is when you connect to the TCP server, it's going to say like, hey, wait a second. And then, and then uh, when you connect to the, the, the HTTP server, it's going to pipe all the data from the person who's connected to the TCP server out to the response of the HTTP server. Well, I'll do it. And then we'll see. Does that make any sense at all? So, so the person typing on Telnet in the TCP server will get piped to the response stream of the HTTP server. Where I've jumped the whole step about how Node can do streaming of HTTP requests and whatnot. Um, but let's, let's try this. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. OK. So server. OK. So first of all, we, we need the net package. Um, this is the common JS require. And so we need this for the TCP server. And you do net create server to create a TCP server. And I'll use S for the socket. So you get this, you get this, uh, you get this callback for every connection to the to the to the server. Can you guys read that at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so just just to like make this clear. We're just going to every time somebody connects, we'll just end it and say hello, and let's let's just make sure that that does what we want it to do here, rather than jumping into crazy. So we start node.server.js and it exited. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, I haven't listened on the server. So, right, node actually creating a server doesn't do anything. You actually have to bind to a port, right? So so let's let's listen on port eight thousand. Um, and let's do control Z and node server. Excellent. Okay, so now it hasn't returned. Also, let's see. I don't know if you can do this with your Wi-Fi, but here's my IP address. I don't know if anybody else wants to play around with this. Um, but if I tell net now to in a new tab uh, to port 8000, then I should get terminated connection with hello. Um, okay, that's boring. So let's kill that server and go back. Um, so actually, what we want to do is is we want to tell the server, we we want to tell the client, hey, wait a second, we're going to wait for an HTTP request to come, and then we're going to stream your output to that guy. So so let's let's instead of ending this, let's just go right. Uh, yo, wait a sec. It's not UTO. It's kind of stupid. And then let's let's have like a little queue or something, and um, put the queue in, put the socket in the queue, put the socket in the queue. Yes. All right, let's try that again. Uh, node server. Um, again, there's my IP if you're interested. Um, Telnet. Hey, wait a second. Blah. Okay, so seems to work. So now what we're going to do is every time there's an HTTP request, okay. So we're, let's 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 create the HTTP server now. Just do this in steps, not get crazy. All right. So we also need the HTTP module, HTTP, P, and we want to create. Oh wait, this. Okay. We have to do HTTP create server. And this thing gets a callback every time there's a request. Not, not every time there's a connection, every time there's a request, because that's what HTTP does. Um, there could be more, request, more, more requests per connection, right? So what are we going to do there? Um, let's just call that server2, because we, we already have a server1. And uh, just, just to make sure that this is working, we'll, we'll do like write head 200. Um, and yo. OK, and we have to listen on that. And we'll, we'll listen on port 8001, OK? Everything look good? 
So let's start that thing. I assume you've written down my IP address by now. So I'll curl HTTP localhost port 8001, and I should get, yo. OK, great. Let's, um, let's just print the headers there. Uh, connection keep alive, transfer encoding chunked. Looks good. Does anybody know why it's transfer encoding chunked? What? Yes. So it is HTTP 1.1. That's that's true, which is good. It has chunked encoding, but yeah, it, it doesn't have a chunk, it doesn't have a, a content length. We 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 didn't we didn't specify like how long this body is. So so by default, Node is streaming things. You can specify a content length and give just a a fixed body for this. But you know, it, it, when Node doesn't know that, it, it has to chunk the the encoding. Um, Okay, so, so we can curl that. That's good, right? That, that's really good. And then we can also telnet to it. So, so we're, we're running these two servers in the same process, right? But we haven't connected them yet. That's what we'll do. Um, so we, we're putting these, these, uh, these, uh, these sockets in this queue, right? So what we want to do is when we get a request, we want to take one of the sockets out of the queue and then start piping the socket to the response. Does that make sense? So let's do this. var socket equals queue.shift. Sound good? We, we pull out a socket. And then let's get rid of that. And then we're just going to do socket.pipe response. So now we're, we're taking the socket that's connected to the, to the telnet and piping it to the response, right? Um, so let's start the server again. And I'll telnet to it. Hey, wait a second. OK. And now I'll curl it. I don't get any response. And then I go, hey, you. Okay, so that's cool, right? No, no nobody, <laughs> nobody likes it. And if I if I do if I kill if I kill Telnet, then it ends the 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 response. I mean, this might seem like like, yeah. I mean, I, I actually just just go home and like sit in my dark closet and rock back and forth and think about like weird weird server things that I can do. But no, this has a purpose, right? I mean, it. <laughs> Suppose you have like a, a game, right? And and like two people pick up the telephone and they start talking to each other in the game, and you want to connect the the pipe of that socket. Okay, it's a bit hard to imagine with a TCP server and HTTP server. It'd be much more understandable in a web socket sort of thing. But I want to make the point that yeah, you can use this pipe thing. Um, this is actually not totally right because um, this this the socket could be disconnected, right? I mean, it, it wouldn't actually work if we, if we started this server and then we like connected to the telnet thing, but then we disconnected, right? Now the first thing in the queue is disconnected. And yeah, well, it, I mean, let's see what happens when we connect again. Hey, okay. yeah, did that work actually? No. Oh, I typed that there. Okay, well it gets the next one. Okay, so so I think you you probably have to you probably have to um, add a little bit more here, which is um, oops, bim, like you know um, You could take it out of the queue. You could you could just like keep doing this until like you know if socket writable um, or readable. There's this readable property on socket. I'm going to go through the stream interface in a second, um, or something like this to get a socket that that's actually readable. You know, and like if not socket, then like. You know, respond 
no sockets. Are you guys following what I'm doing here? Yeah. Does that make sense? Because I mean, you want to you want to go through the queue and make sure that you like have um, a socket that can actually like be uh, read from, and then I think. If we do that, then then if I connect to it with curl, it should say like no sockets, no sockets, no sockets. And then I go over here and tell net hey, and then connect to it, blah. Okay, so yeah, that I think that's the proper the proper server code. Um, okay, back to the slides. But I have to jump around because I did this poorly. Um, Right. So anyway, so part of this this new uh, version three is uh, it, the all the streams have it, previously. We're kind of iterating on this idea of a stream, and we weren't really sure what this should look like. And we're kind of going back and forth. And a lot of this has to do with API. Now we have kind of a base class for all streams, which is uh, the stream module dot capital stream, and. Um, so streams are either readable or writable, well, or both, right? So, so, so they're kind of split into these two classes because you have a lot of streams that are kind of one way, right? Like a request in an HTTP server is readable only, right? It's, it's only data coming in, and the response is writable only. Um, and like a file, if you're like catting a file, then that's kind of readable only. Um, but a socket, like a TCP socket is duplex. So that's both readable and writable. Um, OK, so, so here's what a readable interface looks like. It emits a data event with a buffer. Um, it has a pause and resume. I explained those earlier. And then it has a destroy, which is like, OK, close that. Like, I cannot deal with anything more. I'm in an error state right now. Please stop. Um, and a writable stream is something that emits a drain, right? You can, well, first of all, it has a write. You can write buffers to it, which get queued up, and then it, it emits drain when, when that queue goes all the way down. And you can end a stream, too, which is, which is kind of like safely hanging up. right? In a TCP connection, this would be just sending the fin packet. It doesn't necessarily mean that the connection is completely destroyed. You're not just shutting it off, because the other side might be in the process of sending more data to you at that moment. right? And destroy is, is like destroy in the other one, which is just like stop. Just stop. We cannot deal with anything. So, so here's some examples okay, um, in Node of, of various streams. So process.standard in, like the standard in of your process is a readable stream. fs.readStream, which is like the Unix cat command, basically. You take a file and stream it to you. Um, a server request, your server side, you're taking a request that's a readable stream. Or if you're a client, you're making a request. No, wait. No, no, no. If you're a client and you're receiving a response, then that's a readable stream as well, right? Opposite. Um, and then if you start a child process, like standard out of the child process, that's also a readable stream, right? If you're getting it. Writable stream, standard out of your process, uh, writing to a file, like appending to a file or something like that. A server response, writing to a server response, child, anyway, you can see. And then duplex connections, of course, uh, are always there as well. Um, <clears throat> yes. So we did that example. Yes. So now uh, I want to talk about pushing strings to sockets, uh, which is an important problem for Node. Um, so this is an old benchmark with some uh, a couple of servers, uh, Nginx. I assume you know these servers. Do I have to explain them? No. Uh, Tornado, Python thing, thin, also Ruby thing, Nginx, fast thing, and Node, a very old version of Node. Um, and what we do is, is we hit it with uh, 300 concurrent clients, and we just kind of see, like, what, what based on the response, we, we configure the servers for different response sizes, varying from, like, two bytes to, like, 256 bytes, and just kind of see, like, what, what sort of response times do we get when we vary the size of these things. Um, now, if we do it with a buffer with Node, if we, if we use this, this kind of buffer thing, um, then the benchmark looks like this. So here's the, here's the three. Um, so, so response size is on the bottom, right? We're, we're doing this test for many, re very, many different response sizes. We're like just kind of seeing what sort of throughput you can get. And, and the, the latency is, is on the uh, vertical axis, right? And so, so smaller is better here. 
right? Um, and so, uh, right, Nginx is at the bottom, and Thin and uh, uh, Tornado are, are kind of there, and Node looks like this, um, which is good, whatever, okay? Um, but that's not really the point, um, because often you don't have buffers sitting around. Well, I mean, if you're doing this sort of proxying thing, you do have an actual buffer, but oftentimes you're like creating templates and doing this sort of thing. And I mean, basically you're manipulating strings a lot. And so oftentimes you're pushing a string to the socket. So what does this situation look like if you create a string and you just push it to the, to the socket? What, how does this benchmark change? Um, so again, here's what the other ones were doing. I didn't change the other servers for this, right? So they, they look about the same, and here's a node. Um, just, it, it, it's so sad. It's just, <laughs> it's very pathetic. And I, I'm just so, I'm so happy that this hasn't, there's all these blog posts talking about how node is not performant and blah, 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 and yet there's like obvious performance, like gaping holes. And nobody has pointed this out yet. Like, I mean, there, there are very real performance problems. This is a very real performance problem. Most of the blog posts that I see are not pointing out very real performance problems. They're pointing out very contrived performance problems. This is a very real performance problem, right? At 256 kilobytes, Node is responding with three-second latency. Not acceptable, right? So um, Node is terrible at pushing these huge strings. And I believe that the reason for this is that Node can't actually get a pointer to the memory of that string in V8. It has to copy it out every time. Every time it pushes to the socket, it copies that data of the string out of V8 into a separate buffer and then pushes that to the kernel. And that extra copy, that extra step kind of kills you. Um, and so what will happen, hopefully, in the near future is a, um, a patch to get into V8 and get those raw memory addresses. It's, it's very tricky business, right? Because GC could happen at any point, and you have to be very careful about these memory addresses because they could get compacted and moved around, right? So the, that's why V8 doesn't expose those, those memory regions to you. But if you're very careful, you can grab them for just a brief second, write it down and um, send it out. And so, so that's another thing that will hopefully land in uh, 0 03. So that's all I have. I could also do one more demo. Um, I would like to, but I'd rather uh, answer questions if you have any. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, right, so, so uh, I'm the only committer in Node, and uh, patches are submitted to me via various different channels. Um, but basically, email me with a patch, and I look at it, um, and uh, I reject it, or I accept it. Um, no, there, there's usually there, there's a development mailing list, uh, Node.js-dev Google group, um, which uh, is... Uh, pretty active and, and usually people will post a patch and then we'll discuss it for a while and you know either it'll be too controversial or you know it's totally obvious and we'll, we'll submit it but basically it's like that and I'm trying to stay on one week release cycles which uh, has fallen apart in the last couple of weeks but trying to be around there two weeks maybe but but basically every time every week you know if it's kind of more or less stable then then I put out a release Or, or whatever. I mean, or just give me a diff. I mean. And um, the issues list on GitHub, does that um, get more regard? Uh, like less so. It's better to, the, the mailing lists tend to be where all the discussion is hap happening. Okay. Yes. If, you're, if you guys don't have any questions, then I will not let you go early.
I will um, use my remaining time to entertain myself in front of people. Um, please, but please, uh, any questions? OK, how about I entertain myself and you ask questions? Um, so let's, let's write a chat server. And we're going to do it in, uh, in uh, just a plain old TCP. And I don't know, was anybody able to connect to my server at all during the last? No? Oh, that's too bad. Um, yes. This is my IP address, I assume, right? That's EN1. Yeah, that should be it. All right, well, th this will be less fun if you guys can't connect to it. But um, I'll leave that up there just in case. Um, OK, so, so, so how would you write a chat server in uh, just a, a plain old, like, uh, do you remember the old uh, uh, talk command in, in Unix? Was it called talk? Yeah, chat. No, no, no. Talk. Yeah, yeah. And you, you would talk. You would say a username, and then you would start communicating. So, so let's, let's write that like a, a crappier version, though, because I can't actually. So, so let's create a TCP server. And um, what we're going to do is very similar to what we did before. Um, we're going to kind of have a queue of people that are, are connected to the TCP server. Um, so, so this is the basic setup. You create a queue, and then every time the socket, every time somebody connects, you do queue.push um, socket. Okay. Okay, so, so maybe we should call this people instead of queue. And so this is going to be like all the people connected to the chat server. Can you guys see that? OK. Um, right. OK. And so now, every time data arrives on this socket, we want to broadcast it to all of the people. right? So socket on data is how we listen for that. And we get a buffer, which we'll call D. I'm going to um, put this in here and make this big. Okay. So, and then what we're going to do is just loop over the people in the, in the people. So how do you do that? I forget. Um, for var equals i less than people.length, i plus. I haven't figured out like these cool new JavaScript ways of looping over things. Um, so you do this. And then all we're going to do is, is do um, people i dot write d. Does that seem to work? Well, let, let, let's, let's see. There, there's some problems with this. If you're astute, you might figure them out. Um, so what happens is, um, let's, so we have, to, we have to start the server. OK, node server, and then telnet localhost 8000. Hey, wait a second. Did, did it do that before? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> OK, so it's, in particular, it's echoing to myself. If I also connect to it from another terminal. Oh, sorry. OK, so, so kind of working, right? What's going to not work is if I disconnect from one of them, um, because that socket will still be in the array of people, right? This is where using a toy language like JavaScript really screws you. And I, I get um, <laughs> closed. Oh, sorry. This is a JavaScript group. I forgot. Um, <laughs> I was at QCon last week, and it's just like, oh, yes, ha, ha, great. Um, so what, what happened? Why, why did the server throw the error? 
what, remember I closed one of the terminals and, and like I wrote in the other one. And I mean, what, what happened? I mean, the socket was still in the people's array, right? And, and we tried to write to it and it wasn't connected anymore. And so it threw and it said like socket not writable, right? So, so what we have to do is, is like somehow delete these, these guys that are in there that are, that are already deleted. Um, and so what I suggest, rather than, I mean, we could do like something on end, on end is, is an event. Actually, I'll help, you guys are all JavaScript people, so you could help, usually I don't do it this way because I never remember how slice works. But I think you can actually take this socket and slice it out of um, people. I guess it's like order log n or something. Yes? Is that right? Yeah. People dot splice index comma one. Okay. So when this socket ends, then we're going to take it out of that uh, array. So I think that should solve the problem. Let's let's test it. Okay. So we connect with two people. Hello. What's up? Okay. And then we close this one. And then we go, hello, anyone there? No. But I think we can reconnect and, hey. OK, let's make it one more thing. Let's, let's make it slightly cooler. And let's just do this. I mean, let's, let's write like a little identifier. So let's put like a little bracket or some, something. So, so each of these guys has a remote port. And so that's just like an like a integer. And of course, integer plus string equals string. So we could just do that, and we could write out like a little identifier before we echo the stuff to everybody. Oh, and we could we could not like self we could not we don't want to echo our own thing. So like if people i equals equals socket or whatever equals 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 continue. <laughs> okay, so so that that looks all right, right? So that should be an actual chat server where we connect to it here and connect to it here. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm on the other one. And this is the end of the talk. Thank you.